guys, apologies for running a little late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I was early yesterday. Anyway, uh, let's get started. I'm happy to make this as quick as you want. Uh, so let's start off with the end of the Brussels conference today. Uh, Secretary Kerry is, of course, en route back to uh, the United States. Uh, he concluded his participation in the Brussels conference on Afghanistan earlier today. Uh, he reiterated the U.S.'s commitment to Afghanistan's stability, progress, and prosperity. The conference uh, reaffirmed the international community's steadfast support for Afghanistan's continued development. And at the conclusion of the conference, the international partners confirmed their intention to provide $15.2 billion in support of Afghanistan's development priorities uh, from 2017 to 2020. Um, also wanted to note today, the United States joins more than 40 nations to issue a joint declaration for the export and subsequent use of armed or strike-enabled UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, the declaration is a political commitment by its signatories uh, that underscores growing international consensus uh, that UAVs are subject to international law and stresses the need for transparency about exports and represents, we believe, an important first step uh, towards comprehensive international standards for the transfer and subsequent use of UAVs. Uh, this joint declaration will serve as a basis for discussions on a more detailed set of international uh, standards for the export and subsequent use of armed or strike-enabled UAVs, uh, which the United States and its partners will convene in spring of 2017. Uh, these discussions will be open to all countries, even if they uh, chose not to uh, j join the joint declaration. Yes, sir. Of course. Are you physically unable to pronounce the word drone? <laughs> drone. There you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, as a world leader uh, in the development and deployment of military UAVs, uh, the United States seeks to promote efforts to ensure the responsible export and subsequent use of this rapidly developing uh, technology. Finally, uh, I know many of you uh, were on the call earlier today. Uh, but uh, regarding uh, the effects of uh, Hurricane Matthew, uh, we obviously continue to track its path uh, very closely. Uh, President Obama spoke to the impact of the hurricane this morning, um, and as I noted, we held an on-the-record call. Um, uh, the earlier today, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development announced an additional $1 million in humanitarian assistance, including food vouchers, food rations, cash transfers, and meals at evacuation shelters for communities in Haiti that were affected by Hurricane Matthew. This brings the total USAID humanitarian assistance for regional uh, Hurricane Matthew uh, relief efforts to $1.5 million. Uh, this new funding comes the day after uh, USAID activated its uh, disaster assistance response team in the Central Caribbean. Uh, this team has deployed to Haiti, to Jamaica, and to the Bahamas, where they're continuing with the governments of the affected countries and the humanitarian organizations on the ground to bring vital humanitarian assistance to those in need. We continue to advise U.S. citizens in affected areas to make preparations immediately to shelter in place in a secure location and to follow the emergency instructions provided by local authorities. Um, Matt, I don't know if you've got up-to-date information about uh, the embassies that you'd asked about yesterday. You're good? Okay. I don't know if anybody else is interested. Embassy Nassau uh, closed for routine consular services uh, October 5th through 7th. Uh, and the airports in Nassau and Freeport remain open. In the Dominican Republic, um, Embassy Santo Domingo is open with limited operations October 4th. Uh, and American Citizen Services uh, has officers present to assist any U.S. citizens. And finally, Haiti, uh, Port-au-Prince is closed for routine consular services October 4th and 5th uh, and has advised U.S. citizens to shelter in place. I think that's all I have. So over to you, Matt. Um, all right. Let's just start with um, Syria first. Sure. Um, so the Russian foreign ministry says that Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov spoke again today about Syria. Is that correct? Uh, they did earlier today. All right. I'm very, very confused. Yeah, I thought just two confused. days ago you said that they were, that this bilateral contact has been suspended. That's a quick suspension unless the situation on the ground has changed. No, I, I mean, look, Matt. Do you guys uh, actually do anything that you say? <laughs> come on, Matt. Um, what? No, I mean, look, engagement remains. So what we talked about the other day was bilateral engagement with regard to Syria. 
Uh, that remains suspended, but it certainly doesn't preclude the two far, uh, the two uh, uh, well, Secretary of State and Foreign Minister Lavrov from talking. That's, you don't consider that to be That's engagement? That's not, and we've been very well, clear. What they do, then, uh, yell at each other? Well, not at all, but look, first of all, it would be irresponsible for us, given what's happening in Aleppo, not to touch base with Foreign Minister Lavrov periodically. But also, I can say in the last 24 hours, um, you know, he, uh, Secretary Kerry has spoken to uh, his counterparts in UK, in Germany, in France, or not France, rather, uh, in Germany, Turkey, uh, the EU, and Qatar. Uh, and as you know, uh, uh, Under Secretary uh, Tom Shannon's in Berlin today, uh, attending that meeting. I would say the conversation, which also touched on Ukraine, I'm talking about the conversation he had with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, also touched on Ukraine and uh, North Korea. Um, but it was part of those multilateral efforts now that are going to continue because we recognize they got to be part of the conversation. What happened the other day, the suspension, had to do with that particular bilateral uh, cooperation that we had thought we had reached a conclusion on in September uh, 10th in Geneva. Uh, that effort uh, is suspended, but that doesn't preclude us from talking. Okay, but I, 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 I don't What's get your, it. I mean, go usually ahead. When, when, <laughs> when a government comes out and says that it's not going to talk to another government anymore, that you know about something, you, that that means you don't you don't talk to them anymore. So that's not true, Matt. And in fact, I would argue, I, I would argue to the contrary that it would almost be irresponsible for not, us not to have any conversations with. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and with the Russians going forward well, about yeah, the situation the point, on the ground the in point Syria. Was in Moscow today. Of course. I, yeah, I know. But I mean, this is you know the to big talk one. About Ukraine. The, right. But the big the big thing here, the big bilateral engagement that was going on was between the secretary and the foreign minister. Right. So, I, you know, if you when you come out and you say two days ago that you're going to suspend the engagement, and then what, forty less than forty eight hours later, the engagement has it's, resumed without any change in the situation on the ground. It just looks kind of odd, no? No, because uh, it, does to me. It, it doesn't change the facts on the ground, as you know. We don't have a cessation of hostilities. Uh, we don't have humanitarian access. We don't have any of the elements, the core elements of that uh, September 10th agreement uh, in the process of being implemented or implemented. Uh, there's no going to be no joint implementation center. None of the if you will, carrots either for uh, Russia, at least what Russia proclaimed to want, uh, that joint implementation center is moving forward as well. But I think, you know, and I tried to stress this yesterday, while that particular bilateral channel is now suspended, we're not going to just walk away from what's happening in Syria. We're going to try to, on the multilateral front, try to coordinate with uh, like-minded partners and allies. Um, and stakeholders, and that always includes Russia and, and Iran. Unfortunately, that does include them. All right. So this, then, you would characterize this conversation as a bilateral engagement in a multilateral setting. Is that what you're trying to say? In a multilateral kind of like effort. Effort. Yeah. Kind of like the way you used to talk to the North Koreans, <laughs> bilaterally as part of the six party talks. Uh, Is that? I mean, I'm just trying. No, to no, no. I understand it. I understand it. I. Look, I, I, I just don't understand if you, if yeah. you, I, you know, you tell the Russians one thing and then you can turn around and don't follow through on it. It's, I mean, that's what it looks like to me. So I appreciate your argument that that's not what it is, but I just think it's very confusing. Well, um, optics aside, what it is was, you know, uh, uh, simply a call. Uh, they talked about uh, a number of issues. They did talk about the situation on the ground in Syria. Um, you know, my argument back to you would be it would be irresponsible for uh, Secretary Kerry not to raise uh, what's happening in Syria and make our concerns clear about what's happening right. there. But that it doesn't mean that. Responsible, but it's not a suspension. That, that that means that the contact hasn't been suspended. So that's a, that's what I'm saying. Anyway, I, I, I don't I, agree. I, I, I'm what? done. So. Yeah. Yeah. Is going to Moscow? Is he going there yes. bilaterally as part of this multilateral? <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, <laughs> all right, I, I get it. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Foreign Minister Ero is trying to pursue uh, a, a French proposal. Uh, I'll leave it for them to talk about the details of it. But I think, you know, in the wake of the failure of us to implement uh, in any meaningful way uh, the December uh, or the December, the September uh, 10th agreement, 
you know, other options need to be looked at, both internally, and by that I mean within the interagency in the U.S., but also externally with all of our multilateral partners. So we're talking to the ISSG, and we're talking to uh, other like-minded partners and allies, and that's uh, pretty much the what's happening today in Berlin. But we shouldn't expect there to be fewer calls between the secretary and the foreign minister. I can't predict the uh, frequency of their contact. Um, so about three or four a week. Yeah. Again, you know, how I would characterize this is, you know, we're not going to stop talking altogether. We're very clear about this is a suspension of bilateral cooperation with regard to Syria. Yes. But. This but didn't, then they were on the phone talking about bilateral cooperation. In it's Syria not at all. Today. It's not all true. They they did talk about Syria briefly, the situation on the ground. Again, you know, the secretary would be remiss, frankly, not to raise our concerns about what's what's happening there. But let's go back to what we were talking about with bilateral cooperation. It was a nationwide credible cessation of hostilities. It was uh, this joint implementation center. Uh, which would have had us working with Russia to strike, uh, carry out strikes against Nusra and Al Qaeda. All that's suspended right now. But Mark, we've been talking to the Russians for four years, and we've seen the results this week. I can't argue that the Russians, you know, uh, uh, seem intent on carrying out uh, the, uh, the strikes they continue to carry out in support of Assad against, uh, or uh, yeah, against the civilian population of Aleppo. Um, and we're going to continue to raise our serious concerns about it. The timing now to talk about Ukraine, Ukraine and North Korea, I mean, is there something uh, urgent? Um, I mean, with regard to Ukraine, uh, certainly, uh, as Matt <laughs> uh, stole my uh, thunder, but uh, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Toria Nuland is in, actually, Moscow, I believe today. She may have, she may be wells up, I'm not sure, um, but specifically there. The stole your thunder now. Just joking. Um, but uh, uh, she's there specifically to work on, you know, what we've made a priority, which is implementation of the Minsk agreements. Did you talk about the harassment of the U.S. diplomats? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if that came up. And on Berlin meeting, do you have any, any readout? I don't. I tried to get a readout. It's just wrapping up, frankly. Uh, so I, I'll try to get, if we have something meaningful to say uh, about it later today, we'll get that to you guys. And uh, um, Secretary <coughs> Kerry, when, when he comes tomorrow, he will receive uh, the French foreign minister. You will see him here or? Uh, I'm not sure if we've confirmed that or announced it yet. Um, so. Russia today announced it's suspending or terminating two more cooperation agreements with the United States as follows the, the decree by uh, Vladimir Putin on Monday. Uh, what do you have on that, and what does this say about the, the deteriorating state of U.S.-Russian relations right now, based on everything else we've discussed here today? Yeah, I think you're talking about some of these reports we've seen, and we've just seen, frankly, media reports on this uh, 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 so far, um, so we've yet to receive official notification from the Russians uh, about uh, the suspension uh, of an agreement on uh, cooperation in nuclear and energy energy related uh, scientific research. Um, if they're accurate, we would regret uh, the Russian decision to unilaterally suspend cooperation on what we believe is a very important issue that's in the interest of both of our countries. And how do you assess the current state of U.S. Russian relations? How do we assess it? I, I think our, you know, our assessment is while we have failed to uh, cooperate meaningfully uh, in this recent effort on Syria, uh, we continue uh, to disagree where we disagree with Russia, and that's on Ukraine, certainly with what's happening in Syria right now and in other areas. But where we can cooperate constructively, such as uh, nuclear agreements, and in fact, you know, the other day they, they uh, suspended this uh, plutonium. Uh, 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 um, plutonium management and disposition agreement, uh, that's a real tragedy because these are areas that we had successfully cooperated in the past. And again, it's in the interest of both our countries to continue those efforts. Mark, uh, please. Uh, regarding the options that the uh, U.S. government is discussing, are you getting close to the decision? Uh, any meetings uh, that you can talk uh, I, about? I, I, I don't want to necessarily preview some of our internal uh, U.S. government meetings. Um, uh, I'll just say that, uh, you know, we continue our efforts to look at different options uh, in the range of what I talked about yesterday. Yeah, please. The, the pro-Kurdish party in Syria, the PYD, 
now controls significant areas of northern Syria. And they're going to hold a conference, they said this weekend, to announce the establishment of a federal system in the three cantons that they're now administering. What's your position on this? Well, our position, position rather, <laughs> excuse me, um, has been uh, that the future of Syria should be decided by uh, Syrians, uh, consistent with uh, the political transition and election process that was outlined in the UN Security Council Resolution 2254. And that resolution states that the Syrian people will decide the future of Syria and that the G Geneva communique should be the basis of a Syrian-led and Syrian-owned political transition. Um, put more simply, uh, we support the territorial integrity uh, of Syria. And we also support a unified democratic Syria in which the rights of all groups are protected. Um, so um, in direct response to your question, we'd urge uh, Syrian parties, all Syrian parties, to work together uh, in a manner consistent with UN Security Council Resolution 2254 uh, in order to advance that political process. So what we don't want are groups working on the margin, uh, creating their own systems or their own de facto states. Uh, this all needs to be worked out uh, through a political transition that's enshrined in UN Security Council Resolution 2254. That sounds like you don't support this. <laughs> I said what we do support. I tried to be affirmative in my description. Please, in the back, Michael. Uh, sorry. One more Syria. Uh, one more Syria. Did you see this uh, report by experts that were working with the uh, ISSG about the strike on the aid convoy? Uh, their claim, the report uh, is claiming that it was a well-prepared stage. Uh, refuting reports that it was an airstrike. Yeah, Michael, I did see those reports. And, you know, um, we've been very clear uh, laying out uh, what we uh, know uh, occurred in that strike against the humanitarian convoy and that any uh, bogus reports to the contrary uh, don't refute that. Uh, have, you, have you received this report, analyzed it? We've, we've actually seen no uh, uh, signs of any kind of report like this. Uh, I have no idea where that came from. Um, again, uh, what we have said has been based on our best uh, intelligence estimates of what, uh, uh, assessments rather, of what happened. And uh, I just would uh, strike down uh, any kind of bogus reports to the contrary. Just one more on this, on Aleppo. Um, have you seen reports, or are you aware of um, certain groups from either side preventing civilians from leaving the city or the, the, the eastern part of the city? Um, by any groups, I have not. Well, I mean, either by the moderate rebels that you support, by Nusra, by the government, by... That are actually preventing Syrian, uh, as civilians citizens, rather, civilians, yeah. rather, from, uh, from leaving. I'm not, no. Please go ahead. I don't know if you've already spoken about this, but... What is the U.S. perspective on the idea of the U.N. Security Council, Council adopting criteria to restrain members from using a veto um, when there are concerns about them having committed war crimes? Uh, I, I haven't actually seen that, um, you know, and I don't want to necessarily uh, preview how we would vote, but um, uh, certainly uh, we take those uh, – it's an important issue. Uh, we take those kind of questions into consideration, but I don't have anything to kind of preview. Uh, are we uh, – yes. This will be quick, I yeah, think. Sure. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask you about the statement on the, the settlement. Um, oh, yeah, of course. It's pretty clear that you're unhappy about this announcement, both what the announcement was and the timing of it, timing of it for two reasons. And my, so my question is one that's been asked not many times before, but if, in fact, you feel this strongly about settlements, and if, in fact, all of your previous denunciations and condemnations of them have gone to, you know, have gone unheeded or un, un, unlistened to, what is the point of coming out with these statements repeatedly <clears throat> and expecting a change in behavior? What, what, when, if you think it's this important, is there actually going to be a, even a threat of a consequence. Uh, first of all, um, you're talking about the uh, statement we issued a short time ago. Um, I do want to uh, 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 condemn, though, the fact that we've seen reports of rocket file, fire rather, 
uh, from Gaza into Israel. Uh, we would strongly condemn uh, rockets and other attacks uh, from Gaza into Israel and urge all parties to avoid any escalation. <clears throat> um, I think with respect to your question, Matt, um, starting from the fundamental principle that our commitment to Israel's security is unshakable, and we just concluded, uh, obviously, the uh, memorandum of understanding that was <laughs> alluded to in the statement. Um, and that commitment stands, but when we see Israel carry out this kind of action, new settlement activity, announcement of new settlement activity, that frankly contradicts uh, its stated goal to have or to uh, achieve or pursue a two-state uh, solution, uh, it raises uh, serious concerns, and we have to publicly and privately uh, convey those concerns to, to the uh, government of Israel. Um, I recognize your question and, the, and the, the, is that our comments have no effect. Um, we still believe it's important uh, to make clear how we view the situation on the ground and the effects of these kinds of actions are having on Israel's long-term viability as a democratic uh, state in that region and a Jewish state in that region. This stuff only sets us sets back the two-state uh, peace process, a two-state solution, uh, and uh, makes it harder. Okay, so th your comment just now, does that uh, th that's an acknowledgment from the administration that you have no leverage with, with Israel, despite the fact that you give them billions of dollars every Again, year? Yeah, we believe, this, we believe. You just said that. Well, no, first that, of all. That, uh, that your words have no effect. So it is, are you acknowledging, or is the administration acknowledging that it doesn't have any, any sway, any pull? With Israel? What I would say is, and it's it's important that we continue to convey uh, to Israel uh, when we see uh, actions that we believe are counter to Israel's long-term security interests and counter to their stated goal of pursuing a two-state solution. And when we see that, we're going to call it like we see it, and we're going to convey that. But you don't actually expect them to do anything about it, is that? I can't speak for what whether their behavior is going to change or how their behavior is going to change. Well, I mean, the administration. You say these things, but you don't actually expect them to, to act on to act on them. Well, of course, we wouldn't say them unless we were, you know, mindful and hopeful that they would uh, uh, absorb them and act in a way that was consistent with, as I said, their long-term interests. And frankly, in the law, in the even short to midterm goal of creating the kind of climate on the ground that is uh, would even lead to the possibility of uh, negotiations and a two-state solution. Well, since you begin, since you started, since the United States starting started opposing this kind of activity decades ago. And I, you're I, right, decades ago, and yeah, uh, Republican and, administration. As I'd say, yes, 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 I know you go through <laughs> the whole thing. Have you, have, has it ever? Has it ever? Have you ever seen? Uh, have you, have you ever had any success? Well, there's been, I, I realize yeah. there have been short term freezes, but it just seems to me that if you there feel this strongly about it, to come out with a statement like this that talks about the, the MOU that was just signed and uh, President Perez's death, it, it, if you come out with a statement that strong, um, don't, I mean, <laughs> Don't you expect it to have some kind of an effect? You, you yes, clearly we do. feel strong about it. Of course we do. But, but you, have, you do expect it to have some kind of effect, but you know that it won't? I, you're saying that I, I was simply responding to your question that we don't have, we're not going to take any action. And I, what I was trying to make clear. Is that correct? You're not going to do anything. Well, again, we, oh, our action is that. Them feel bad? No, but our action is that we convey to them, uh, both publicly and privately, and to the world when we see Israel. Uh, Conducting itself in a way that runs counter to its security interests. Respect to yourself, to the the the, po the, uh, the podium, you issued this statement from a spokesman. Now your language has got tougher over the past uh, uh, past few few months, but isn't it time for uh, Secretary Kerry or for President Obama to be using the kind of language that, that you know, you're using from the podium today? Well, you know. Um, uh, there have been times in the past when it has come, these kinds of uh, 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 words have come from either Secretary Kerry or President uh, um, Obama. And 
the message is always the same, which is, you know, we view settlements as counterproductive and counter to Israel's interests. We're going to keep up with that message. We're going to keep conveying it to the Israeli government when they take these kinds of actions. I think this one was, as we noted in the statement, particularly uh, um, exceptional uh, in the fact that it came, uh, you know, mere days after we had concluded this memorandum of understanding. Uh, and also in the wake of uh, one of uh, Israel's leading statesmen, uh, Shimon Peres's death. Let me just press the point that Matt did, yeah. you know, a bit further, because, you know, you tie it. You say that you talk about the memo of understanding, talk about the largest deal, you know, you just concluded. And in fact, you know, at the end, towards the end, you, you say how this will only draw a great deal of criticism and, and uh, you know, basically condemnation from the international community and distance Israel from many of its partners. Why not then? Why not go to the Security Council or to the United Nations where you can have an international uh, some sort of a decision that can impose sanctions? I mean, you impose sanctions on others that, you know, basically, uh, you know, do not adhere to international law uh, by any measure. I mean, look, um, with regard to the UN Security Council um, and any action uh, at the UN, our position hasn't changed. Um, you know, uh, we're always concerned, uh, frankly, about uh, one-sided uh, resolutions or other actions uh, that could be taken within the UN. Um, and we're always going to oppose uh, those kinds of resolutions that we believe delegitimize uh, Israel's Israel and undermine its securities. But, um, you know, we're going to carefully consider um, our future engagement uh, if and when we reach that point um, and determine how to most effectively pursue and advance the objective that we all at least claim to share, which is that of achieving a negotiated two-state solution. Um, that work's going to continue with our international partners. Uh, and uh, and uh, and we're, we're going to continue to make clear when we have concerns, such as we do today, uh, with regard to Israel's actions. Uh, we're going to make those concerns clear to the Israeli government. But you have done that time and time again. I mean, obviously, you believe that Israel is addicted to the expansion of settlements. You know, isn't that in a way? And you keep pumping money. Isn't that a way like someone? giving their son, you know, well, drug money to continue doing what they're doing? You know, don't you want to stop at one point and say enough is enough? Well, look, you're saying when you get to that point, it's been 50 years say, since this occupation has taken place. Say, so let's just separate the two issues. So, um, you know, our ironclad uh, commitment to Israel's security right. is both in Israel's security, national security interests, but it's also in the U.S.'s uh, national security interests. Um, you know, US, the U.S. is safer uh, when there is a safe and secure uh, Israel uh, in the region. But that's particularly why uh, we find its actions so befuddling. Uh, when it takes actions such as continued settlement activity that run uh, counter to uh, what we're all trying to achieve here. And so uh, we're going to continue to press that case to them. We have a very close and very frank and candid relationship with Israel, uh, we're going to continue to call it like we see it. Uh, and when we see this kind of activity that we believe is counterproductive, we're going to say so. But is it because it feels good? Because you feel, uh, you know, that no, you I mean, like to say, say we, you, you know, you know this the around the world. There are issues that we constantly raise, whether it's in the realm of human rights or whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't preclude us from having uh, cooperation with any government in any other uh, area. But, you know, we're also frank when we see something that we believe uh, runs counter to uh, their interests and our interests, that we make that clear. I appreciate you indulging me, but, sure. you know, uh, you keep saying that the UN is a, a forum that is, you know, uh, somehow inherently opposed to Israel, while in fact it was created through the UN organization. But let me ask you this. I mean, if, it, if it is, this is an occupied territory, which you acknowledge, and there are laws that pertain to what is, you know, what is the occupying power's, you know, rights and privileges or obligations uh, under international law. Why not, you know, push forward, put your weight behind what is, you know, internationally lawful in this case, and bringing 
you know, Israel to bear on these issues, holding it to account. Um, look, I'm just going to say we're, you know, we're working on this bilaterally. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working uh, with other international partners. Uh, we're just not convinced that the UN is the right venue for that. My last one. Sure. You said that when the time comes. When will the time come? When do you, in your opinion, when no longer there is any kind of land to establish a Palestinian state on? Is that like maybe you know ten well, percent, and, and ten we, percent more of and, the land? And, and you know, say so we said land? as much in the statement uh, that was issued that you know it's getting to the point, especially given the geographic location of this latest settlement announcement uh, where, you know, uh, a Palestinian, a viable Palestinian state uh, becomes increasingly difficult to imagine. Please turn in the back. Ukraine. Ukraine. Actually, okay, I have two sorry. questions. So the first one is regarding uh, the tension of Ukrainian journalists in Russia. So the international community, including European institutions and international organizations, concerned about uh, this arrest. And two days ago, the Department of State said that uh, there is no a lot of details to say about it. And uh, do you have any statements now? I, I don't have much of an update to provide. Um, you know, we're obviously monitoring the situation very closely. Um, you know, I'd refer you to Russian and Ukrainian governments uh, uh, for the latest on this. Um, I, I don't have an update to what you just mentioned in your in your question. I apologize. Are you in connection with the Ukrainian government on this issue? I'm sure we're discussing it with them. You know, we're, again, we're always concerned when any journalist anywhere in the world, but certainly a Ukrainian journalist uh, in Russia is, 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 uh, is arrested or detained. Um, we're monitoring it closely, but I'd refer to the uh, Russian authorities uh, for more details. And the second uh, question. Uh, you said that Secretary Kerry and Minister Lavrov said today about Ukraine, they have a conversation on this issue, and uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Nuland is in Moscow. Uh, could you comment what is the current, uh, current position of the United States regarding uh, developments in Ukraine? Um, well, as we noted, uh, or you noted in your question, um, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, uh, Toria Nolan, was, uh, was in Moscow. Uh, she was joined by uh, uh, National Security Council uh, senior directors, both Celeste Wallander as well as Ch Charlie or Charles Kupchin. And uh, they did meet in, on October 5th um, with uh, Russian officials. Um, you know, I, I think the focus of their trip was in making progress on Ukraine, what are the next steps that need to be taken um, uh, in order to get the Minsk agreements uh, fully uh, implemented? Um, you know, just because we s suspended cooperation in other areas, our bilateral engagement or with regard to Ukraine is going to continue, uh, and let there be no confusion about that. Um, you know, the re Minsk agreements remain really the only viable way uh, to restore peace and stability in eastern Ukraine. And we're going to continue to support and to push for their full implementation, uh, which requires, as you know, a real ceasefire, uh, full and unfettered access for OSCE monitors, uh, elections under Ukrainian law uh, that meet OSCE standards, uh, and the withdrawal of foreign forces and equipment. And finally, the return to Ukraine, and this is an important one, return to Ukraine of control of its side of the international border. Obviously, a lot of work still needs to be done in this regard, um, but we still believe that this process, the Minsk process, uh, represents the best way to get there. Please. Iraq, uh, Iraq I'm sorry. You, <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the AFP, Agence France Presse, uh, reports that a U.S.-led coalition strike, quote-unquote, most likely killed some 20 pro-government Sunni tribal fighters near the city of Mosul as they were mistaken for ISIL militants. Uh, considering the fact that the U.S. helps coordinate Iraqi forces gearing up for a Mosul offensive, how could this happen? Um, I'm aware of reports of that. I honestly, uh, I, I would just have to refer you to the Department of Defense. I, I don't know the specifics and what has been reported. I'm sure um, that there's an investigation underway looking into the. Just more broadly, yeah. um, when 
the U.S. hit the Syrian military on September 17th. Officials said they didn't have good intelligence. They didn't know where they were hitting. Would you say in Iraq the U.S. has good intelligence, especially with partners on the ground? Um, I mean, I'm not an intelligence officer. Uh, to put it uh, as bluntly as that, um, I really would uh, uh, point you in the direction of someone who can speak about uh, the level of our intelligence cooperation uh, with Iraq, or, and uh, and certainly um, I, I would make the assessment, though, that our cooperation with the government of Iraq uh, militarily is obviously uh, much closer than what we have on the ground uh, in Syria. Um, while we have a deconfliction mechanism in place with the government of, or the ministry – between our Pentagon and the Ministry of Defense uh, of Russia, uh, that only pertains to, you know, uh, uh, deconflicting our operations in order to protect the safety of our airmen and airwomen. Um, but with regard to uh, intelligence on the ground, uh, you know, um, Syria is uh, a difficult uh, case uh, because of a lot of factors that we've talked about on numerous occasions. Um, that said, um, you know, when we assess our intelligence, we make every effort to ensure that it's valid and credible uh, before we would carry out any airstrike. Um, if that airstrike uh, mistakenly targets the wrong individuals or, or hits civilians, uh, we own that. Uh, and uh, we conduct a thorough investigation and, uh, and uh, we're as transparent as we possibly can be about it. About these, uh, these uh, reported uh, mistakes, uh, given several apparent mistakes within the past uh, month, including a strike uh, in – strike last week in Somalia where the U.S. targeted al-Shabaab militants but ended up reportedly killing 22 uh, Somali soldiers. Would you say U.S. targeting in these anti-terrorist operations is precise? Uh, we have taken out uh, numerous uh, members of al-Qaeda and ISIL's uh, senior leadership uh, in both Iraq and Syria and elsewhere, and Libya as well. Um, and uh, so I think that speaks somewhat to the precision of our strikes. Uh, we're not barrel bombing. Uh, civilian targets, uh, hospitals, schools, uh, civilians, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, while uh, on any battlefield uh, errors do occur, uh, I would hold our record up with uh, anyone. Please. Uh, yesterday, Iraq Parliament uh, passed a motion to ask Turkish forces to remove from Iraq, and today, Iraq Prime Minister Abadi also called on Turkish forces to leave the country, and the Turkish foreign minister again said basically Iraq parliament does not represent all of Iraqi people, and uh, it looks like it's going to stay there, Turkish forces. What's your position on, on that? In general, uh, with regard to um, Iraq, um, you know, we said this before, all of Iraq's neighbors need to uh, respect Iraqi sovereignty uh, and territorial integrity. Um, that's the premise of the counter uh, – the global counter uh, ISIL coalition. That it operates under – in Iraq, and we expect uh, all of our partners to do the same. So Turkey argues that uh, the, the Turkish forces are there to help the upcoming Mosul operation. Do you think that the Turkish forces are helpful there? Do you have any recommendation on that front? Well, again, I think, you know, part of uh, – our ongoing dialogue with Turkey, with Iraq, uh, with other forces on the ground, with Kurdish forces, uh, with regard to Mosul and upcoming operation is uh, coordination and making sure that, uh, you know, that we're all focused on the same goal here and that uh, um, uh, everyone's working in strong coordination with everyone else uh, to achieve the objective, which is obviously uh, liberating Mosul and driving Daesh out of Iraq. So in that context, Turkish forces are helpful in the coordination? Are they I would refer you to – so I'm not trying to be coy here. I'm just trying to say I, I think it's up to the Iraqis and the Iraqi government to speak to um, Turkey's role in Iraq. Uh, and it's important, as I said, that whatever Turkey's role is in Iraq, that it's coordinated with the Iraqi government. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask you a question about the UN. It seems that the Security with, Council – I didn't hear what you said, Iran. I said, no, not the Iraq. UN, I'm sorry, the UN. Oh, UN. Okay. It seems that uh, the Security Council just uh, may have just chosen uh, Portuguese diplomat Antonio Guterres 
uh, to succeed. Ben Kim do you have any comment on that? I do. Uh, we can confirm that today's straw po poll exercise in the UN Security Council uh, resulted in the clear identification of Antonio Guterres as the preferred candidate to be the next UN General uh, Secretary General. Uh, we anticipate that, this, that the Security Council will hold a formal vote tomorrow uh, to confirm his nomination. So that's the next step. Uh, and then obviously after that uh, would, be, uh, 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 would be for the full UN membership uh, in the form of the General Assembly uh, to consider that nomination. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a few steps remaining. Uh, we would expect uh, the full membership to approve the Security Council's actions, uh, but we'll wait and see. But we're very pleased uh, to have been a part of this new uh, selection process that give, uh, gave member states and civil society opportunity uh, to engage directly with the candidates in open fora. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to be part, part of these uh, discussions. So. Are you in any way disappointed that there were 12 candidates, six were women? Are you in a way disappointed that not a woman was not chosen for this post? Well, um, look, uh, the United States, uh, as a matter of longstanding policy, does not make <clears throat> its voting preferences uh, known on secret ballot elections. Uh, we are however, well acquainted with uh, Mr. Guterres for as many years working on the international stage and can state with confidence that uh, he possesses uh, the leadership qualities uh, that will be crucial uh, to serving a, in this uh, vital post. Um, you know, this was uh, an election uh, and so as such in the selection process and I think what's always important is that uh, there's a number of candidates, a diverse set of candidates, there were in this case, and uh, that there was an open forum to discuss uh, the qualifications of each one. Well, wait a second. Yes, sir. How can you say that you clearly supported them? I mean, all 15 Security I, I, Council I ambassadors came out and said I, I they understand. had consensus. If you had not supported him, then there wouldn't have been a consensus. So what, it, I mean, what is this? <laughs> Plus, the General Assembly vote, isn't that public? That is. Yeah, they all go to their little buttons and push the you know, and yes. push them and, and so what is this? You don't make a practice of talking about your voting preferences. We don't make a practice of talking about our voting preferences. So, uh, so if it would be eight seven, you wouldn't say which way you're <laughs> no. coming down. Well, it is it is said or alleged that you opposed Bulgarian diplomat Irina Bokova very strongly. Is that true? I'm not going to speak to our voting preferences, Matt. Okay. Please. On subject. <clears throat> yeah, please. Because we don't have enough fun in here. Well, because you mentioned there's a broad international experience. Is this the first time you've backed the uh, chairman of the Socialist International for an international post? Um, uh, you've, you've caught me out. I don't know. How many other have there been? I'd have to Google, I'd have to, I'd have to Google that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you have any information you're able to share about any Americans who were um, injured or uh, directly affected by Hurricane Matthew? Uh, I do not. I don't know if we talked about this in the call earlier today. My apologies if it was brought up. Um, I don't think we've got, but again, this is the kind of assessment that's going to take, uh, uh, you know, not, we don't have an initial, or we do have an initial assessment, um, but, you know, as we've seen in the past, uh, um, natural disasters like this, um, we may not have a full picture for some time. Um, I don't believe, let me quickly look through here and see if we have any. Well, there you go. I've got to start listening to those calls. Is that it, guys? Just, uh, okay. Can I just do one okay. more on this one? Yeah. Um, Call me out again that I didn't read the transcript of this morning's call. It wasn't in there. I don't, I was on the call. I didn't hear anything directly about that. All right, we'll have this out afterwards. We'll have it out after. Um, <clears throat> do you <laughs> do you have any intention of creating a working group similar to the one that existed uh, <clears throat> after the earthquake in Haiti with regards to uh, the the hurricane? Uh, how so? In terms of uh, prevention or uh, for I, future the events? State Department had a they had right. a working, yeah to to look at the effects after I didn't know if yeah. there had been discussion of creating a. I mean, honestly, uh, it's a fair question. Um, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that, you know, given the, um, uh, the frequency of hurricanes and tropical uh, storms in, uh, 
in that part of the world um, th that a lot of research and a lot of examination has already been done, evaluation. Um, you know, I think in the days and weeks to come, we'll have a better assessment of probably steps that can be taken uh, to avoid uh, damage. And again, it's going to be country to country because some of these countries don't have the kind of uh, preparations you might see in some of the other countries uh, with regard to materials available to protect them and uh, et cetera. It's probably too early for this as well, but uh, Haiti, as a result of the hurricane, I, I, has abandoned its attempts to hold a presidential election next week. Suspended is what suspended, I heard. Suspended, yeah. yes. Uh, so. And they have been suspending their presidential elections or canceling them fairly frequently over the past three or four years. You've regretted in the past suspensions of their elections. This obviously I think we'll give them the benefit of the doubt here that they're right. recovering from uh, a natural disaster. Sorry? That was a good call. That was a good call. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you had one more. Yeah, I did. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this warning that Iran has um, given to the Saudis about its ships approaching Iranian um, waters or territory. Uh, it's quite similar to, or I believe it's similar to ones that they have told the Fifth Fleet or you guys as well. And I'm just wondering if you see this as any kind of an escalation. You know, that they say that they will intercept board whatever the uh, uh, Saudi. So incident. I haven't seen the actual statement. Uh, we'll take a look at it. Um, but certainly, um, if it is as you appear, uh, as you stated it uh, to be. Um, I don't know if we'd view it as an escalation, but it's certainly unhelpful, and we support uh, freedom of navigation uh, uh, in that part of the world, as we do everywhere. Just one question on Turkey, Mark. Uh, I know this question was asked two days ago, but since then there are several more media outlets uh, shut down. There are about 121 journalists in Turkey right now. There are very few critical media outlets left in country. <coughs> I am wondering, as an ally of Turkey, what is your assessment after two and a half months since the coup uh, about the Turkish administration's uh, policies regarding freedom issues? Well, I think our concerns remain uh, the same, which is, you know, we obviously saw the uh, Turkish government uh, react strongly uh, to what was a coup attempt uh, uh, and conduct a, a carry out an investigation into the uh, causes. and who was behind that uh, uh, coup attempt. But we've been very clear from the early hours afterwards that uh, that should not uh, directly affect uh, Turkey's democratic institutions, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, and kind of the core tenets of Turkey's uh, constitution. So that's a message that we continue to convey to the uh, Turkish government. Thanks. Thank